welcome back. So, was your mind blown when you tried to figure out all the secrets of the universe? You now know what's going on? Well, hopefully you've got a little bit about what some of the main questions, those fundamental questions about what's going on with our universe, and what do we know and what are we still trying to find out? So guys, let's go talk about what is out there. So cosmology is our big picture out there in terms of looking at what is our universe like? What's going on with our universe? I mean, we've talked about, you know, solar system, we've talked about stars, and we've talked about galaxies, but when you look at cosmology, you really are looking at the really big picture of what's out there. And so, I kind of like to start with this picture just to remind you that we've got stars out there, and we've got galaxies out there, and whereas we may not be able to see any of those planets out there, we certainly know that they do exist. And so cosmology is defined as a study of the really large-scale properties of the universe. It attempts to understand the origins, the evolution, and notice that, the ultimate fate of our entire universe. So what's going to happen? When's it going to kind of end? You know, is it going to end tomorrow? Hopefully not. Well, we think it's still got a long ways to go. We do know that approximately 13.7 billion years ago, the universe was an extremely hot, dense place. And it was only a few millimeters across. So we take everything that we know of and we have today and we put it back there. And we are talking then about an extremely dense, very, very hot space. We know that the universe we see today came from those expansions. You know, really when time and space and matter all came into existence, to really go ahead and form this really empty, cool space we live in now. We are certainly not like, if we look at conditions here on the Earth, nothing like what the original conditions were. And yet, based on what we've talked about, we can look back and we can make some educated guesses on what that original universe looked like and why it's ending up the way it looks today. This is one of the images looking at the background light from that early, early, early times. Luckily we have, and we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, all these satellites out there that are helping us to gather data about the universe. And then we're going to try and put all this data together that we're getting from these satellites to figure out what was going on. And this is an indication of what they think that early light was about. You didn't really have stars. You didn't have the types of material that we you know, look at protons, neutrons, and the electrons and other particles today. It was kind of like this gluon, just quark material that was there. And everything was the same all the way through because, you know, we only wasn't very large at that point. And again, I've got some simulations I want to show you that attempt to go back and look at what that beginning looked like. Now, there are a number of really important satellites, and if you think about what we're able to do now, in the late 60s on, I mean, we started sending satellites out, and the first satellites we sent out really looked at what was going on with the Earth as well as what was going on within our solar system. And so we were able to visit the really all of our planets, with the exception of Pluto, who, as we know now, is not even a planet anymore, you know, and give us some feel for what's going well now, We've got the ability to have a number of satellites up there that are in orbit around the Earth. So they're outside the Earth's atmosphere, and they're really able to start looking at the rest of the universe. And so if I look at several of the satellites that are looking at cosmic rays, we've got a couple of those up there that are continually providing information and helping to then map the entire sky based on what's going on with cosmic rays. And so trying to figure out exactly what they are, where they came from, what their frequency is, you know, does a cosmic ray from, you know, let's say a supernova look different than a cosmic ray that's given off from material that's coming from a quasar or from material that gets ejected out as a star is being cannibalized by a black hole. Remember, cosmic rays are going to be very, very energetic. Then the next ones down I'm looking at are gamma rays, Again, very, very energetic, very short wavelengths of light, very high frequencies. I've got a number of satellites that are out there looking at that. Some of these are just put up by the United States. Several of them are combination from the United States and other places. Some of them are international satellites. This is something that the entire world is looking at 
trying to figure out what's going on within the universe as a whole. Then, of course, we've got the X-ray telescopes that are up there. You can see we've got a number of those. Uh, Chandra's been up there for a while. Uh, a lot of these others are very, very new that are going up. Ultraviolet. Now, the CHIPS is looking at the extreme ultraviolet bubble that's around our solar system. And that's probably one of the only ones in this list that is really looking at within our solar system. Now, if you look at the list of satellites, guys, there's a lot of them that are looking at the planets within the solar system, huge number that are around the Earth looking at what's going on with climate, everything else. There's a vast number of them around Mars. Um, there's several of them around moon. the moon looking at the... Um, amount of water on the moon, looking at the gravitational attraction on the moon. There's several out there looking at how the moon is interacting with the sun. So there are a number of other satellites that I did not list here, and I was really only concerned with the ones that were looking at the universe as a whole. Notice they only have one in the visible part of the spectrum, and that's the Hubble, and that's certainly been up there for a number of years. You know, we're not so interested in just what's going on in the visible part of the spectrum. That tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us nearly as much as what it does if we know that, okay, this is what's going on in the visible part, this is what's going on in the X-ray part, this is what's going on in the infrared part of the spectrum, this is what's going on in the microwave range of, you know, and you're putting all that information together to get really a complete or a more complete picture of the galaxies that we have out there, the stars that are out there, whatever object we might be looking at. Uh, in looking at the infrared part of the spectrum, there's a Herschel up there, there's a WISE, the Spitzer, which has been up there for a while and is delivering tremendous amount of information. The microwave background, WMAP has been up for a while, it's producing a huge amount of material. And we're going to look at some of these uh, on Blackboard to see exactly what they're telling us about the sky up there. Then we have a couple of other orbiting satellites that are not necessarily looking at the electromagnetic radiation range, but if I look at, you know, someone will look at the history of star formation in the universe, you know, the gravity probe B, looking at Einstein's series of relativity, so you are looking at what does the gravitational field around the Earth look like? What does it look like around the Moon? What is that telling us about, you know, how then the Earth itself is interacting with mass around there? Um, and you find out that if you look at some of these pictures from um, the Earth and looking at their gravitational field, it does not look like a nice spherical Earth at all. It kind of looks like a big lumpy potato. So what is that telling us about the early parts of our solar system and what happened? Kepler? Kepler is finding huge number of planets around stars. At one point when I was in school, we were taught that you know, most stars do not have planets around them. And now we're looking up there and all kinds of planets around stars. Um, SOFA is looking at it's a flying observatory that supports a number of these other satellites that are up there. We're looking at the chemical composition of the interstellar medium. Okay, what is out there? What are those dark molecular clouds made up of? What do we see out there when we have these new stars formed? What is that percentage of increase of the heavier elements within our, our universe as we start making these new stars? You know, all kinds of satellites out there. I mean, we're talking about massive amounts of data that are coming in to help us understand what's going on within our galaxy. And not only within our galaxy, but basically everything else that's out there in the universe. The other thing that we need to talk about is Hubble's Law, because as we talk about what's going on within the universe, what's going to happen? How is our universe going to expand? How is our universe going to evolve? And so Edwin Hubble discovered that the distances to galaxies were proportional to their redshift. And remember I showed you that picture the other day about those galaxies, those really distant galaxies, and it was very, very, very yellow, and showed then the redshift of those galaxies. And see, if guys, if I had been smart, I would have had that here again. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, the further away than they were, the faster away they were moving. So that said something about what was going on with our expansion of the universe. And if I plot distance versus speed, then I get somewhat of a straight line. Now notice, guys, they've drawn in that nice red straight line. 
but in reality you still have a number of galaxies that are on either side of it. And one of the big quests right now in astronomy is try and really tie down some of those distances to really far galaxies. Remember we talked about Cepheid variables? Well, that's one measurement of really distant galaxies, but you know, that's not going to give us these galaxies that are looking at receding, uh, you know, at 90% the speed of light. I mean, we're just never going to be able to measure anything within those galaxies. So, you know, we've got these great Cepheid variables, but it doesn't work on all galaxies. And so, you know, it's really difficult to tie down those distances when we're talking about something that is receding from us and that we're looking back in time at, you know, 13 billion years ago. So, as we try and determine exactly what those distances are to those galaxies, we'll have a much better feel for how the universe itself is expanding. And so Hubble's law says V is equal to H sub zero times D. And V is nothing more than the recessional velocity of galaxies. So we're talking about really far galaxies that are moving away from us at at speeds certainly approaching the speed of light. H sub zero is a Hubble constant, and D is a distance to the galaxies. And like I said, if we can go ahead and figure out what those distances to galaxies are, the, the really far ones, then we'll have a better feel for what that universe is doing as we expand. And that expansion, is it going to continue to expand forever? Is it going to go ahead and slow down and basically stop and come rushing back? you know, exactly what's going on. And, and I've got some simulations that we'll look at on Blackboard to talk about what happens if we have an open universe in terms of the space or a closed universe in terms of space and exactly what that expansion is. Now, I want you to look at this picture. So what are you looking at? Well, I'm looking at the Earth right in the center, okay? And i got a huge number of galaxies right there. And those galaxies that are in the darker blue right from the center point right here, which is where the Earth is, and notice that as I go further back across my slice, that redshift is greater and greater and greater. So those are my galaxies that are receding from me. And notice my timeline down here. I've got one, two, three, and four billion light years. And so those are the galaxies that we have within our universe, certainly not all of them, just a large number of them, okay? And so you can see the density of those galaxies and how that density changes as I move back. Now, notice, guys, we're just looking at, you know, from 330 degrees to, you know, um, 30 degrees on one side and like 150 degrees to, like, what, 225 on the other side. So we're only looking at a portion of the sky out there. This would be true no matter which direction I looked. And so by looking at this, we're able then to go ahead and plot those galaxies and see how they do change with distance from the Earth. And more importantly, start looking at these really large structures that we see in our galaxy. First thing when you look at it, notice it's not solid. It's not a solid of blue that just gets lighter and lighter in color. We do seem to see these big voids that you see right there. Okay, And there does seem to be structures, these filament-like things, that do exist within our universe. Well, why would we have these big voids and we almost have these galaxies that are lining up along the outside of these voids? Okay, So our galaxies do not seem to be distributed equally all the way through. In fact, if I look at this picture, we're talking about something called the Salon Great Wall. So this is one of those sections that we look at and then we find it that Salon Great Wall is 1.4 billion light years long. So this is one of the largest, well, it's not one of, it is the largest structure within the universe and it's composed of all of these galaxies that seem to be bunched along the Great Wall. Well, exactly what's going on there, we're not really sure why does that structure exist, and exactly what's happening, and you can see in this picture too, you do have definite voids. 
So why do we have those very large voids? Is it because of the gravitational attraction? Is it because of what's going on with the dark matter and dark energy? I mean, we don't know. There is lots and lots of questions out there. We're still trying to put all the pieces together and really come up with that nice completed jigsaw puzzle for what is going on within the universe. So guys, I want to end with that picture right there. And this is a picture of the Hubble Deep Field. And I showed you this picture the very first when we did my you know, vacation slides through the universe. But everything that you're looking at in there, with a very rare exception of something that has a spike on it. And so I've got a star right there, and you can see that I've got a spike on that. Um, but basically everything else you see in this picture is a galaxy. And it doesn't seem to matter what direction I look, I'm going to see these huge numbers of galaxies. And remember, guys, that the further away that I'm looking at these galaxies, the more that I'm looking at in the past. And so if I could somehow take that time and, and somehow travel back to when those were new and young, I would be able to see what our universe was like. But we don't have that ability to do that. We're looking at our universe as it existed, you know, 13.7 billion years from those beginnings. And so we're trying to take all this information that we've got and put it together and give us a completed picture of what our universe is, where it's going to go, and what's going to happen. Well, all those pieces go together to give us a good feel for what's going on within the evolutionary sequence of the galaxy as well as then, how did our universe get here and why is it behaving the way it's behaving?